Hi, this is part five, Mirror, Mirror and the Wall, um, in search of the Anima Mundi for EA Zoom, the 30th of May, 2019, Michaela villiers Kendall. So, um, well, this is continuing, um, following the thread from part four, uh, through the film story, Myth of the Shining, uh, Stanley Kubrick's movie. So in part four, um, the first part of the film, the interview was explored. That's the first section. Um, uh, in the opening of the film, the yellow VW was seen traveling along the road of the sun, which is really called the road, road of the sun, um, meant to express that the, uh, the path of the sun, the imaginary path of the sun, obviously through the zodiac. Um, so uh, it was accompanied by Mozart's Desiree, uh, which in fact at the, at the time I didn't say that actually uh, is, is the title is The Last Judgment. Um, and that's very significant for the film. <clears throat> so um, I decided to, to use the, the tarot cards a little bit um, to, 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 to illustrate things because obviously in part four, um, uh, I talked about the Kabbalah and the Tree of Life and the fact that the tarot uh, cards were introduced in um, medieval times um, to signify the 22 paths of, of, uh, of the Tree of Life. And um, th they're represented by the 22 major arcana cards. And uh, the, so I don't know if you can see these very well. They're, they're lovely cards, but they're black and white. And I, decided to use this hermetic tarot as it's talking about Hermes, I can't pronounce anything at the moment, the uh, Hermes, anyway, uh, based on the esoteric workings of the secret order of the Golden Dawn. So it's a famous pack that they've re, re, I don't know if you can see that. No, it doesn't show very well, but anyway, that's it. It probably won't show up. But anyway, that's, so this is the last judgment, if you can even see that, because it's so faint. But anyway, it's showing um, the resurrection and the, you know, blowing the ram's horn and um, the angel and yeah. So that, so and Uranus actually up in the corner, um, ruling this card uh, and, and Uranus, and it's called the, the spirit of the primal fire. So Uranus actually is, uh, represented in the tree of life and it, it represents reflections, which is interesting because obviously the start is set in the mountains with the lakes and the reflections from the lakes. And that's very important for the film, as I said before, um, mirroring and um, uh, dualistic. Um, right. Okay. So, so, so that's the 20th tarot card. Um, and, uh, I think I said that, yeah, okay. Right. Okay, so I wanted to go on to the next one, the, the um, show the Tree of Life diagram. Oh, okay, we'll say that, <laughs> we'll say the quote. There are but two powers in the world, the sword and the mind. In the long run, the sword is always beaten by the mind. And surprisingly, that's Napoleon Bonaparte's saying. So, okay. So the timeline of, of the movie so far that we've got up to in the interpretation, uh, the interview was starting around September 24th, fall equinox, because that sort of shows in the office because of the Cardinal Cross. So the sun would be at nought degrees Libra. Um, and it, it's, it goes, the first part really goes to October 1st, um, seven to eight degrees Libra. Um, and that's to do with the festivals, the pagan festivals that fall on that date. But I won't explain that now, but that's why that time frame. And so that's the interview. And then it goes on to closing day, which is this part we're exploring now, which is the second part of the movie when the, the hotel is closing. And that's when the Torrances uh, arrive at the hotel. Obviously anyone, I'm assuming everyone's seen the movie, but obviously if you haven't, then you need to follow it with this, with this uh, um, cast. So anyway, um, so closing day, October 24th, again, a month later, 
uh, the sun enters naught degrees Scorpio, so it's getting darker, and that's very significant for the film. Um, time is very important, um, and uh, it's it's that it's a few days until November first, and that's extremely significant because um, that's the the date of the contract. It's it's the winter caretaker's contract, and that again that's uh, falls on um, pagan festival. Uh, which is, what is the Pagan Festival? <laughs> I, I, I'm re mentioning it next time, so I haven't noted it down, but obviously that's Halloween, All Saints Day, All Souls Day, which has a, which has a, I can't think of it, Bel Beltane or something, no, Beltane's May, anyway, never mind. Uh, but anyway, this section is represented by the chalice, and that comes at the end. So, to go on to the next frame, slide, excuse me. So, it's the tree of life. And as I discussed it before, um, this time I, I, I touched on the meanings, but this time I wanted to, and I did mention that um, it has its counterpart, its opposite, which is the tree of death, uh, which is actually called um, uh, the, the clip off. Um, so it's, it's called the, yeah, it's called the uh, Clipath. Clip, sorry, Clipothic tree. So, and everything is opposite to the tree of life. So it's like a reflection. So again, it's like that Uranian reflection. Uranus is the mirror. It represents the mirror in this. Uranus being represented in the tree of life by Chokma at the top, number two there. So anyway, so to, to say something about the tree of death, um, it, uh, it, in Jewish Kabbalah, the klipot are shells surrounding holiness which emerge in the descending chain of being as part of the purpose of creation. Contact is not sought with the klipoth, but is seen as part of the process of self-knowledge. But in some hermetic Kabbalah, such as the so-called Illuminati, and I'm not going to go into the Illuminati this time, I did touch on it, but to, uh, to, to say that the actual, the Illuminati that we're talking about was the one founded in, at the end of the 18th century, around the time of the revolutions and um, the founding of the USA. So, um, it, and it was based, they used their name based on the Renaissance Illuminati, although they had no connection with it, except to use alchemy and obviously based on the Kabbalah and based on the, yeah, tree of life and all that. Anyway, so say something about the clip off this time. Um, okay, so the premise is divinity, according to the Jewish Kabbalah, connotes revelation of God's true unity. But the clip hot, uh, and the clip hot, Clipot are the counterparts of the, the sephirot, which are the ten um, words of God, the paths, the ten paths, the main paths shown here in the, in the Tree of Life. <clears throat> so, but the clipot are external rather than internal. Uh, they are obstacles to divinity. They ascribe false dualism in, in the divine and are synonymous with the setra akra, or the other side. The perceived realm opposite to holiness. Kabbalah dis distinguishes between two realms in Klippot, the completely impure, evil, and the in intermediate. All this is very complicated, but I'm just do my best. Um, in Ezekiel's vision, Ezekiel's vision from the Bible, uh, 1 verse 4, the passage reads, and I looked and beheld a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire unfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. The three completely impure clipot are read in the first three terms. The intermediate, which is the one that's less evil, and that is called the shining clippeth, which seems a connection. Um, and that's called noga or brightness, it's known as. 
It, it's read in the fourth term, mediating as the first covering directly surrounding holiness and capable of sublimination. So it's capable of, of, of being made pure to refine or to make pure. So it has that effect, it's not fully evil. And that would seem to have um, a connection with the twins in The Shining um, because they're dualistic, they're twins, and that they are the first to appear. Um, and they, yeah, exactly. So, and then they, they, they are warning. So the clipothic tree consists of 10 spheres in opposition to the Sephiroth, as I said, on the tree of life. These are referred to as the evil twins. Okay, that's why. <laughs> or evil demons of matter. And they are the shells of the dead. So that explains a lot with the, um, the haunting in The Shining. And, and obviously it's referring, because as I explained in part four, the hotel and the maze outside, inside the hotel and outside are maps. And they're a map based on the Kabbalah. But even more complicated, they're based on um, the tree of life and also the tree of death. So it does get quite confusing, but um, it's fascinating and very clever. So anyway, the paths. So the paths, the ten sephiroths, and we're talking about the tree of life here. That, so the Hindu word chakra uh, translates as wheel, and because of course the chakras are involved as well. And when we work with the astrology, with the Kabbalah, we end up in a higher, more conscious place. The lessons we encounter on the tree of life are known as tikkun, re rectification. And as we experience them, we spiral higher on the wheel, on the path to consciousness and ascension. Uh, interesting, it's ascension day to day. I didn't plan that, but anyway, <laughs> that must be a good sign. Okay, so going on to the next slide. I'll have to dig up a slide of the, um, the tree of death next time. Okay, so this is just to reiterate um, about the office in, in the last, one because it was hard to it was hard to show the eagle and um, it is it is quite important because the eagle the, the aspect from the office this was in the interview shows the summer caretaker on one side the winter caretaker interviewing Jack Torrance on the right side and then the window behind with the mountain the mountain represents um, the, the top of the tree the top of the tree, which is called Kitha, Kitha, yeah, Kitha, and that's the highest point. That's um, and that is represented actually in this card, which you probably can hardly see. Again, oh, hold on, yeah, it's the universe in the tarot, and you can see it is a double-headed eagle that comes from the Egyptian uh, eagle. And uh, Saturn is there too. So Saturn obviously represents Capricorn as well, the mountain and the north as shown as the compass. So that's obviously what uh, Stanley Kubrick was trying to point out. He's trying to orientate the tree. And yeah, so that, that's that. And you've also got the, um, you also actually have, you, it's so small you can't see it. There also is, is the fixed cross in, in that as well the Taurus um, and Leo and Scorpio and Aquarius. So it does bring the fixed cross into it. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's that. So, oh, I just wanted to say too, there was actually, and I missed it last time. Uh, actually, I've got a, a picture of it. I think it's the next slide. Move on to the next slide. Of the flock of loons which is a, yeah, there you go. So that's um, another picture in the series of the, uh, the other ones. I think he had at least one more up on the walls of the um, entrance to the office. And the other one was the great mother. This is, and I forgot to mention this one, is the flock of loons, which actually you can see in the doorway when uh, he shows a shot of the uh, summer caretaker coming in the door. So you can see it behind him. And that's actually significant. That these are a series 
done by a shaman, a Canadian, native Canadian shaman. And um, this actually represents migration, but it, it, it represents the migration of the souls. So he's saying about returning lives in that. So he, he it's another clue to, uh, they are, all these characters have returned. They're, they're, um, they're on another lifespan and life's, re lives, uh, obviously reincarnation. As, as we, uh, as we um, talk about in, in EA astrology, it's the same basic premise. Okay, so that's that. So the next, uh, yeah, okay. So this is at the end of the interview, which I, I, I couldn't show then. And it's interesting because actually it um, shows, you can't see because it's quite blurry, but between the, in the background, between the general manager and the summer caretaker, it makes a V shape. And he does that a lot in his, in his photography. He's drawing attention like the mountain. He's, he's making a focal point. And behind you can actually see the, that's the model of the maze in between them. And that's a man who is blurry anyway, in, in, you can't see him properly in the film. It's very blurry there, but he looks like a pale man. And I, I think I did mention that last time, but I didn't show the photograph of it because that's probably what uh, Del Toro based his pale man figure of Saturn, Kronos, in, in um, Pan's Labyrinth. So anyway, that's interesting because it's like a shadow. It's like a foreshadow of what's to come because Jack Torrance ends up being fascinated by the ma model of the maze and he stands there himself looking at it in a very sinister fashion later on. Okay, so, um, and also there's the pillars there because that's, that's a, a very relevant point too. Um, Kubrick's painted the pillars red and they signify that the pillars in, um, the pillars in the, uh, in the tree of life. There are three pillars. Um, I don't know if I have, no, I don't have a, I didn't do a diagram of them. So I'll just say quickly about the pillars. There's the pillar of severity, which lies on the left-hand side of the tree of life, but on the right-hand side of the body, brain, um, and it's associated with left brain functions, as I described last time. Um, then in the middle, you've got the pillar of, uh, sorry, on the other side, you've got the pillar of mercy, uh, that lies on the right-hand side of the tree, but on the left-hand side of the body, the brain, associated with right brain functions. Um, and in the middle, you've got the pillar of balance, um, which is the middle pillar running up the center of the tree, and it's associated with uh, holism and integration. Um, also, there are, they, they, have, uh, they correspond to um, the modalities, in astrology, the pillar of severity corresponds to mutable signs. Um, the pillar of mercy corresponds to cardinal signs and the pillar of balance corresponds to fixed signs. So it's all very, very much um, uh, entwined in astrology and cosmology. So, okay, go on to the next one. Just have a drink. Actually. So that's the road of the sun again and I, sh I wanted to show that because that's at the start in the interview and that is actually going towards um, the left hand and that is signifying the path on the left which we were just saying about the pillars so that's signifying um, as we're seeing it but that's a mirror image so actually on the tree of life that is actually the right hand side of the tree of life it's so complicated and that rules the left hand side of the body. Um, so that's interesting because actually on the next slide, which is, which is the next one, um, and you can see that's totally different. Now it's, it's, uh, it's misty. And that's because that's representing the other path up the tree. And this is the route that the Torrances are now taking um, in the, and on closing day up to the hotel on the next journey. So it's the two journeys he's, he's showing and they're showing the paths up the tree of life. Um, uh, yeah, and um, there was something significant about that, I think, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, one, one path is, is from, from light, 
from light to death, sorry, from light to, from death to life and life to death, light to death, well, anyway, I don't know if I have that hand, but I might say that another time. But it, again, it's a mirror image. So one is from light to reincarnation, the other is from death to light. Okay, that's it. Okay, pressing on. So this is the journey then, that's that journey um, up, to, uh, up to the hotel on closing day. Um, and that's when they talk about the, uh, the Donna party. Um, and I did want to say something about the, uh, okay, so I want to say something about those two paths before going on to say about the Donna party. Um, so this section represents the mountaintop, with, which is Kitha, Kita, which is uh, ruled by, represented by Neptune. Um, it represents unity. And then in the, in the, um, in the tree of death, um, its opposite is Thamiel, which represents duality, the opposite. So it's fearful. It, it represents duality, the fearful light of God. So it's exactly opposite. So they're going up the mountain and you can see the mountain top, but in this road, it's, it's reflecting the tree of death. I'm not sure I explained that very well, but um, okay. But that's why the two sides, the two paths. Right, also this journey reflects in the, tree of, in the tree of life, it reflects Chokmah, which is Uranus, which is the reflection mirror representing the great power that goes forth in the beginning, uh, the bolt of lightning to give the vital energy of creation to the processes of Bina, which is Saturn, ruled by Saturn. And opposite to Chokmah is Hegel. That's my pronunciation is awful. Anyway, which means confusion in the tree of death. Those who go forth into the place empty of God. So obviously it depends how you approach it. And really he's, you know, Jack Torrance is already in a negative frame of mind. You can see in the car and he's going towards the negative. He's, he's going already towards the tree of death. So, um, also in that journey is represented by Bina, which is in, in the tree of life, which is ruled by Saturn. And that represents the mountain that bestow, bestows structure of the absolute onto the created. But its opposite in the tree of death is Satharil, which is concealment of God and of the perfect. So you're getting all these elements now and, and that was his intention to bring it, to, to bring it in as the story goes. Right, so about the Donner Party. Um, so they're talking about the Donner Party, which was a massacre that happened in the time of the settlers. And it happened in 1846. And um, I think I've got the, uh, I think I've got the chart for 1846 on next. Have I in the slide? I think so. Does I have? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. That's Donna Lake, the next slide. That's it. So that's a print of Donna Lake where the massacre took place in 1846. And that's when they resorted to, the settlers resorted to cannibalism. Um, and he brings in again, Hesed, which is number four in the tree of life represented by blue Jupiter, um, and it's known as the source of bounty, both in um, idea and in substance. Uh, opposite in the tree of death is Gam Hichoch. Goth. No. <laughs> Gam Hichoch. Never mind. Or devourers. So that's significant. Who seek to waste the substance and thought of creation. So he's bringing devouring there with cannibalism. Um, then also represented there is number five on the tree, which is the, the fifth path, which Sephiroth, which is re represented by red, Geburah, uh, Mars, rules, ruled by Mars, and the positive 
tree of life, meaning is going forth to rule in righteousness um, and up in an upright manner. But in the tree of death, it's opposite, it's Golach, Golachab. Um, and that means who's, those who burn to do destruction, those who burn to do destruction enforce their will on others through strength, not righteousness. And all that, that came into play in the, in the massacre. Um, so I'll just go into the chart of that. Next, the, um, the next, um, yeah. Okay, that's not the next. The next is, um, this is the mask of Dionysus. Says. And as you can see, that's what, that's what Kubrick seems to be basing. Um, that's all right, we'll go back to that, that's fine. Um, that's what he seems, every now and then, he, I think about several times, he has Danny screaming loudly with his mouth open like that. Also, um, Wendy does it too later on. And it seems to be mirroring the mask of Dionysus. And that seems to be brought in in this story of the, of the, um, of the Donner Party. It's in the woods. It's like what, what happens to them is a sort of, um, a sort of, uh, a fantasy overtakes them. They seem to be, um, they lose their reason. So they become sort of hallucinatory. They, um, they drift in through desperation into cannibalism and they justify it. They lose their, they're, they're, they've got a lot of faith and they're very religious when they start, but then it, it creeps that they lose that. But this is showing the, the myth of Dionysus, who was a god and related to the story of Pan and the Bacchae, in which um, in, in, in that story, Pentheus, who is very upright, very religious, very proper, um, he doesn't believe that, um, uh, that, that Dionysus is a god. And so he, Dionysus gets up, gets him to prove, get, tells him he'll prove it by getting him to join in the, with the Bacchae up in the woods. So it's again the woods and the lake and the, and if we go onto the chart next of 1846, when this happened, and that's the next slide. That's the next one. Um, in that chart, it shows there was a Saturn-Neptune conjunction Okay, that's the back eye and everything, but we'll skip that. I mean, you can always go back to that. And that's also, yeah, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, so when this happened in 1846, um, so Neptune was actually discovered. It's okay, we'll go back to the, the first one because we'll just show about Nep Neptune's discovery. The first, the, that's it. Um, so Neptune was discovered in 1846 on the 24th of September in Berlin just after midnight. Um, so interestingly, Saturn-Neptune conjunction on the discovery of Neptune. And it was in a sextile, strong sextile, as you can see with uh, Pluto. Um, and we'll go on to the next chart because that's the, uh, um, there isn't time to look at that, but it's, it's, we need to look at the Donut Party chart, which is next, I think. Obviously, this happened around the same time. Um, this was two months later, December 24th. Um, they actually set off in April that year. The eclipses were in fixed signs. I think Taurus, the first one, and then the Scorpio, when st things started to disintegrate. Um, by the time December 24th came around, 1846, then um, they got to a very desperate point. And it's... Um, it, it's show, you know, it shows in the Uranus moon conjunction there, squaring, squaring Venus and the sun and Mars squaring Saturn, the Saturn and Neptune conjunction. Other things, but we haven't got time to look at it, but um, it, it's, it's a very chilling chart really. And it shows the desperation, but also that they sort of justified the cannibalism. They were forced to let go of their spiritual beliefs, Neptune and become practical but to, to the point of, of violence they went in other words and they went into the premise of the tree of death and I think that's what he's trying to show by that okay so if we go on to the next one 
uh, the next slide. Um, hold on, what's that? Uh, okay. So at the same year, 1846, um, it turns out that the first world's the, the world's first oil well was dug mechanically. Um, oil was actually around for over 4,000 years in the in the east in the Middle East, um, and it was used for um, for lighting uh, torches, even for tarring roads. Um, uh, and many things and uh, even weapons. But first, it was first dug mechanically in 1846 with this Neptune-Saturn conjunction. And um, that's obviously another reason he's used the Donner Party 1846 as he was an astrologer too. He would have been because he was an alchemist, uh, Stanley Kubrick. Um, so he's pointing out that the fact that that's when the black gold oil, petroleum, was first dug mechanically in Baku in, uh, in Azerbaijan. Uh, and actually the industrial world sort of zoomed off at that point. It, America didn't, didn't actually mechanically dig the, old, uh, the wells for another 13 years, but they started 13 years before that. So, and that's when it all kicked off and they really had the first trains there and the first oil driven um, industrial revolution toys um which really started everything but a lot of corruption i mean started from that point and he seems to be i mean the rothschilds got involved and the rothschilds were also perhaps to do with the illuminati so he's drawing a comparison then there and um about the corruption that was probably there and the greed um and he's he's starting that off with 1846 the saturn neptune conjunction so, okay, we'll go on to the next one. And that comes up later in the gold room and all of that. Okay, that's a statue, which is interesting in Baku, which is, um, it's very Saturn Neptune. It's got um, this god, Norse god, uh, slaying the dragon. Um, and they're using that as a sign that they slayed, they slayed nature, which isn't the best sort of analogy, is it? But there you go. <laughs> okay, so on to the next one. You know, it's evil, really. But there you go. It wasn't the dragon that was evil. Okay, Peter Pan. <laughs> okay, so there is an analogy between, obviously, Pan and Dionysus. But also there's an analogy in the film because he, he brings in uh, um, Pan because um, of the nature of Pan, of never growing up, that that is, that is a, a, a type of... That's partly what Jack Torrance was doing. He was locked in never wanting to grow up. And also he brings attention to this by, um, by the, the block of, apart, the apartment block that the Torrances live in is called Kensington, Kensington Apartments, like Kensington Gardens in Peter Pan. And also the crocodile comes into it because the, croco the Egyptian crocodile actually, it seemed like GM, J.M. Barry actually based Peter Pan on, the Egyptian myth of Anit, the crocodile with the butt lion's body, if you remember in part four, um, who, who ate the hearts of those who didn't pass the test with the, the weighing scales. And um, Anubis actually is in some texts, Anubis is pictured with a hook, like Captain Hook. So it's not difficult to see where, and he was scared of time, and that's Saturn as well. So all this is weaved in. Um, Okay, so on with that to the next slide, because there isn't time to go into more about it, but it, it's, it's fascinating how he weaved it all in. So the, the, the crocodile, time, Saturn, that's again Saturn Cronus, um, and the looking glass too, that came out of the, t just after, that, that was inspired after the, um, the 1846 Saturn Neptune conjunction, everything took, I mean, that was about 1861, I think. But it all sort of took off then along with the industrial age, all this sort of fighting religion and, and, and psychology and, and in the industry and everything else sort of got thrown up into the air all of a sudden, along with Darwin's theory. Okay, so, and the crocodile is time and the fear of it. Um, okay, so, which sat in Kronos figures greatly in... Uh, um, in the Tree of Life and in the Kabbalah in the movie. <laughs> I didn't know that moved like that. 
<laughs> Never mind, <laughs> he's getting his watch out. Right, so onward. <laughs> I think the crocodile's after me because I'm running out of time. Okay, so that's the mountain. That's, now this is the mountain, but you can hardly see it. It's a bit blurry. Um, and that's the Overlook Hotel. So the Overlook Hotel is, is itself uh, signified in, 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 the, in the Tree of Life. Um, and as Tipperus, which is number six on the Tree of Life, and that is represented by the sun. So it is the center of the story. Um, the sun represents beauty, uh, the color gold. So in its, in its positive sense of the tree of life, it's the place of great beauty and rejoicing. But in its opposite sense, in the tree of death, which obviously is the haunted past, and you know where there's been the Native American massacre and it's been built on all of that, um, and it's gone against nature. And the tree of death is, it's the, the opposite of Tipperoth is called Thagirion. These words, <laughs> Thagirion. Build and Thagiri, the Thagirion build ugliness and groan about it. They replace Tipperoth the sphere of the vitalizing sun with a place holding Belfigur, Belfigur, the Lord of the Dead. Um, and it's associated with, that Lord of the Dead is associated with licentiousness, orgies, sloth, which comes in later into the movie in the gold room where he, you know, it's like they're having a big party and yeah, um, the ghosts are. <laughs> Uh, or, it, or it's in Jack's mind. Obviously, the, 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 the story is very cleverly on so many levels. You know, it's, it's either Jack going mad or it's really haunted, it's supernatural, or, or it's, it's this story, which is the, it's the bottom layer of, of the, uh, the layers that were hidden in the story. Um, so Belfigur is a demon, one of the seven princes of hell who seduces people by suggesting to them discoveries and inventions that make them rich. And that's obviously why Kubrick was um, pointing out the oil drilled and the Rothschilds involved in that. And even the Nobels were involved in that, who later, um, you know, the Nobels of the Peace Prize, because they started with oil back then and they actually um, produced weapons out of it to kill people uh, in the Crimean War to start with. So all that peace prize uh, are on top, you know, the ancestors, I think it was one of the brothers started the peace prize and they were in Sweden. Um, was it a bad conscience or was it a cover up? <laughs> that was, you know, makes you very cynical all of this, but so perhaps we should be. Anyway, so, so Belfigur's role as a demon is to sow discord among men and seduce them to evil through the ap ap apor apportionment of wealth. Uh, and it's associated that demon with uh, the prime numbers and which brings 666 into it. So this is the demon that obviously um, is, is that personified by Grady, perhaps Delbert Grady, who's in that scene comes later and I'll talk about it later. Um, in, another, in another part, um, but later on in the movie. Um, and he seems to be um, convincing Jack Torrance to, um, through wealth in the gold room. It's interesting. Okay, so de demonic forces are believed to be used as a rod of correction. And that's another phrase he uses then, which I'll, I will say when I get to that part. Um, there'll have to be another <laughs> couple of parts of this because it goes on and on. Um, and may be used in black magic to conduct acts of ill will to others and ultimately only produce works that further the glorification of God. But ultimately, they only produce, even the bad, so it's saying, even the bad works only produce works that further the glorification of God, despite their attempts to do otherwise. So even the evil acts, even the bad influences end up glorifying God, whatever happens. Interesting. Okay, so going on to the next slide. Um, 
So at closing day, and I haven't got that slide of it, but Jack Torrance is shown in the foyer in the lobby of the hotel, and he's uh, waiting for the, the manager, the general manager and the uh, summer caretaker to come and welcome him. They come and welcome him. He's been reading a magazine, um, which is interesting. He's just had some food. Obviously, his wife's just left the room. And, um, and he, the, the, <laughs> the magazine he's reading is Playgirl which is obviously another little clue that Kubrick's left. So it seems to indicate, it brings in to the story, uh, again, in the Tree of Life, um, it signifies Venus, which is, sign is signified by Netzach, and Netzach is number seven on the Tree of Life, means eternity, um, ruled by Venus, and it is the openness of natural love. So obviously the opposite of that in the tree of death is Harab Serapel, the ravens of death who reject even their own. And obviously Jack Torrance does end up rejecting even his own. Um, and interestingly, at this point when he talks to the night man, uh, to the general manager, he says he's got to go and find his family. So a, a point is driven in that you know, at that point, he's saying they're my family, and later he rejects them. So, um, in Netzak, uh, in the sorry, in the Arab Serapel, in the Tree of Death, ba Baal, Baal is attributed, and the ba the word means Lord, and that governs uh, Baal governs pleasure or licentiousness. So the opposite, again, of natural love, of, of natural Venus, Netzach. So um, actually the pillars are seen then, and we don't have a photo of it, but the pillars are seen then, and they've got actually ladders up all over the place because they're getting ready to take down things, doing work for the closing. But those ladders are significant because they represent the Jacob's Ladder theme again, uh, with the angels, that the angels descend and they go up and down, ascending and descending Jacob's ladder. So that's making a point of that and, and the pillars. So anyway, so this is the games room where Danny is at the same time. And this is, he sees the twins again. Um, and he has this vision. And, um, oh, I, I forgot to mention in the, in the other one also that that scene was, was represented with, <laughs> Jack Torrance reading the magazine, was represented by Yesod, which is number nine on the Tree of Life, uh, represented by the moon, the ninth foundation, purple. And this fear holds all the secrets of some, and subconscious powers of the universe. And its heart li at its heart lies the secret of the laws of attraction. Sexuality and passion are governed by this fear. So he's reading Playgirl. Well, that's pretty obvious. And it's obviously something subconscious, perhaps in his past, perhaps his perhaps saying his mother was abusive. I don't know, because there is a sexual abuse thing going on as well. Possibly. Uh, so possibly, but there's something in the subconscious. So the opposite, the tree of death, is those who flee from God. And Yesod is the place of final forms that become matter in Mel Malkuth, which is the kingdom, which is at the base, uh, it's the 10th Sephiroth. Um, and in the tree of death, Gamliel and Nay. Nay Emos, associated with Lilith, the night spectre, and whisperers, they excite the mind and cause strange desires. So again, it's the subverted side of the tree of life. Okay, so this is the games room. And in this, actually, you can see that um, this represents Hod, which is Mercury. So it's games, it's communication. The twins again, Gemini, they've appeared again. So this is all about the game and Mercury and Hod is represented in the tree of life by the complex working of the will of God. So reverberation, communication, Mercury. And its opposite is Samael and that is the desolation of God or the left hand. So interesting. Um, Actually, in the corner, that wooden thing by the uh, cigarette machine, I think it is, is actually in the shape of, um, of Zayin, which, which, which rules Mercury. 
And Zayin represents, is in the Kabbalistic alphabet, represents time. So time again, the crocodile, Saturn, is represented here. And it's together with Mercury. So that's sort of Virgo. Um, so anyway, Danny's getting this vision and it's about time and it's about the dualism and it's about the twins and the working of the will of God. So there are all sorts of things dotted around here. The alarm, when you see a red alarm, that's a warning. You can see it on the wall. You see it in other places in the film. So that's a warning of something. Uh, the poster next to it is like the Minotaur. It's a skier, a snowboarder, but it looks like the Minotaur. And also, um, if you could see closer, it's called Monarch. And um, there are uh, signs that Kubrick is actually talking about um, Monarch, mind programming. So he's drawing political um, attention here as well, saying that the CIA, he has a theme going in the film that, that seems to be saying that, again, that the CIA have dabbled in mind programming controversial and uh, it's all it's called mk ultra and it's like since the cold war but perhaps before the cold war actually um since the time of the, the second world war um and then it went further than that and it is also to do with the illuminati so that's a theme he's got going on um then uh as danny is on the dartboard even the numbers are significant and um i'll, I'll draw attention to that next time because there isn't time but he's being prepared for this game that's ensuing that this battle between him and his his father um on the wall that's the, the flag of colorado but that's significant because that's also been mentioned before denver colorado um is where uh um the company that owns the hotel is based and also um that is the home of the the illuminati that's supposedly the hq so he's bringing all sorts of analogies in there okay so quickly go on i don't know how much time i've got left but i'll just have to stop obviously when i and just continue next time <laughs> um okay so on the tour of the hotel that's the tree of light that's just showing the oh dogs i'm sorry um that's show that's showing the, the um, planetary rulers of the tree of life and the chakras again. But because um, I don't have a, a clip of, of them doing the tour of the hotel where actually the, the general manager tells the Torrances that the hotel was constructed beginning in 1907, which is a significant date because that's when the Federal Reserve um, was created, um, which involved the Rothschilds again, involved uh, supposedly the Illuminati. And that refers to the gold room as well. So he's, he's got a theme going through um, of corruption and, yeah, exactly. Um, so that's drawn to the attention of 1907, in ni the 1907 date. Right, so go on to the next one because I don't want to dwell on that at the moment. We've been over the signs and the planets. So, okay, this is in the gold room when they're having the tour and What's really interesting in the background, you can see one of those ladders and the sort of a crown over the ladder, which is the chandelier, but they've got someone ascending the, on top of the ladder. And that's when Halloran makes his entrance, who's the, um, who's the hotel's chef. And um, Halloran makes his entrance framed by the ladder. So um, it, it seems to be that Kubrick is saying that he is actually connected with the ladders, connected with Jacob's ladders, even possibly, um, as his name seems to suggest, that he, he could have angelic qualities in this, in this mytho mythological, Kabbalistic <laughs> tale that's going on underneath the surface here. So yeah, Halloran is represented as coming from the ladder and he's a good entity. He's, he's representing an angel of some sort. Um, Danny is wearing, on the clothes they're wearing too, he's wearing blue, which is the color of, of, of Jupiter. And Danny's wearing blue, but he's got red on him. And it says flyers, but it looks like liars, the way you're seeing his jacket there. So there's all sorts of hints going on. Okay, and that's the famous gold room that, that gets haunted later. Right, so this is when um, 
they've gone on to the story room. I say the story room because actually as Halloran is showing Wendy and, and obviously Wendy, that's another, that's another um, nod to Peter Pan, Wendy. So anyway, uh, just to throw that in. So he actually refers, as he's showing the storage room, he actually says, if you listen closely, the story room, there's no doubt about it. So this is the story room because he's showing the products in here, but the products tell a tale. Um, first of all, he, he, on this side, on the left-hand side, he shows the, um, the, the, the freezer, which seems to be full of meat. And he points out the lamb's legs. And that's another, um, that, that's another uh, reference to lamb and possibly the ransom sacrifice. It's another, it's another nod to Abraham and the biblical story behind the Kabbalah and, and about sacrifice. So, and about how the son may be in danger as a sacrifice. <laughs> and so he points that out to Danny and asks if he likes lamb and Danny says, no, he doesn't. Um, so he's not having any of that. And also when Wendy's actually being shown the kitchen, she says it's, it, it's so big. Um, she mentions she, she wishes she had a trail of, she feels like she should have a trail of breadcrumbs. And that's, that's sort of a nod to Hansel and Gretel, um, you know, with some sort of black magic going on, witchery. Anyway, so, uh, so there you can see Halloran, he's, um, and his, his, his likeness to the Egyptian, um, to the ancient times with the Egyptian figure there, the sacrifice with the flames. He comes across as Sagittarian. He is ruled by Jupiter. He's right there next to the Calumet tin, which has an Indian headdress, which show him to be part of the, 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 the American native, the natural um, the natural spiritual order that's in the hotel. So the, the, the tree of life, not the tree of death. Um, but above him is Kool-Aid and um, Kubrick introduces that because at the time, um, the Jamestown Town Massacre, and I, I've got a chart of that following, takes place actually while he's filming. So he actually adds that because it's like it, it's, it's another synchronistic reflection of what's actually happening and he very much as an alchemist believes in all of that so he adds the kool-aid to the products amazing um uh, and also behind danny you can see if you look you can see his tech son so he's the son but also he's representing the son apollo he is the son so he is really threatening the crown of the present ruler, which is his father, mythologically. Okay, so I think, oh yeah, and down there there's the Kool-Aid man <laughs> in the, in the right-hand corner who breaks through the wall, funnily enough. <clears throat> anyway, so he's asked, so he, this is when The Shining first appears and Doc asks Danny in his mind, would you like some ice cream? Doc, which is his name that he's known as by the family. Um, and so he shines. Okay, so on to the next one. Okay, it's, I can't really go into it because I'm probably running out of time. But Jim, that's the Jim Jones solar chart. Oh, you can have 15 minutes more if you okay. wish. Yeah. Great, okay. great. Yeah. Okay, so Jim Jones, it's his solar chart and um, it's May 13th, 1931. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about it, but it's pretty obvious, you know, he's got that Venus-Uranus conjunction in the T-square with Saturn opposed by um, Jupiter and, 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 and uh, Pluto. So a large charismatic character, but um, probably very unstable as we know. And um, the moon is there too. It, it might be further on, so it might be nearer a conjunction, but maybe. I guess it's still a bit wide, but it is, it is approaching that T-square. Um, and then you've got the grand trine between Mercury and Neptune, very charismatic. Uh, Chiron sun, though, a wound, a wound in Taurus, you know, a wound in Southworth, perhaps, in, uh, in, in, in money, you know, perhaps greedy, 
um, not to say all Taurians are greedy, but perhaps a poverty wound there and a self-worth wound. And it was, so it's very interesting, his chart, and also that Saturn um, does dominate so much and also Neptune comes into it. But then when you look at the Jamestown massacre, again, you've got, um, and you can't see that side, but you can also always look yourself. There's a, oh yeah, there's a square between Venus and uh, Uranus reflecting his birth chart. And that's in Scorpio this time. And it's squaring, I think, I don't know what that is because it's behind it, but um, it's making a significant square. It must be by a process of elimination that would be <laughs> Pluto. No, Pluto's there. Um, I don't know what it is, but it's making a significant square there. Could be Jupiter actually. Yeah, it's gotta be Jupiter because it's not there. Right, so completely overblown. And it's again, it's that Saturn Neptune theme of making people believe something. Um, literally uh, drinking the Kool-Aid because he got his congregation of nearly a thousand people to drink the Kool-Aid full of cyanide when the game was up with his, his cult. Um, so it just, that just happened synchronistically at the time. So Kubrick used it. As, uh, as an example of don't believe everything you hear, don't believe the lies, don't believe false religions, false spirituality. Okay, so moving quickly on to the next slide. Let's see what this is. Okay. So at this point, um, Halloran is addressing, um, addressing um, Danny about the shining, about the tele telepathy that's just happened between them. And he calls it the shining. Um, Danny's got the, the, the cup of ice cream in front of him, but this is where the chalice comes in because it does, obviously, it, it resembles a chalice. And, you know, that's no mistake either. Um, also, ice cream, um, when Halloran asked him about, would you like some ice cream, Danny, that does have a double meaning because it says, uh, so the Kool-Aid's there above him. So Danny is, is being tested whether to question, to discern whether he trusts someone, whether he believes something. And when Calloran asks him with his mind, do you want some ice cream, Danny? That actually is another reference to MK Ultra because Kubrick does bring into the whole thing that um, about the possibility of black magic, satanic rites, perhaps use of children, you know, very dark stuff. And that there are code names used and the code name for male, child prostitution was ice cream. Anyway, so he does bring all this in because, you know, he's making some very, he obviously feels very strongly about all this and he's, he's brought it in secretly and he has to be careful about it. Um, so anyway, so Danny has been asked to discern by that whether he's trustworthy or not, not just to trust anyone, certainly in someone who's speaking in his mind to him. So anyway, Halloran, um, sits with him and then the cup would signify that he is trustworthy because the, it is the chalice. So Danny is in front of the chalice and the chalice obviously has a lot of meanings. I mean, in, in Arthuri, Arthurian legend, it represents the grail. Um, and so the grail is really the main, you know, is, is the main meaning of the chalice, chalice um, because it, it, and also in the Bible, in the New Testament um, and in the Gnostic gospel, it was said to the chalice held the blood of Christ. And also he drank, Christ drank from it at the last supper. So it has very religious and spiritual connotations. But also in the tarot, in the Kabbalistic um, and Hermetic tarot, it is the um, cup, oh yeah, the ace of cups, which is um, the chalice which is um, Lord of the root, Lord of the root of the powers of water. So it, it represents um, cancer and it represents, um, as it says, it's, it's, a, it's spiritual. It's, it represents Kitha, which is, is the crown. So it's talking of the crown of Kitha, the highest point of the mountain, the, um, the linking of energies between divine and human, which is what Halloran is doing. 
and it would indicate that Halloran is connected with the arch archangel Metatron, not that he is Metatron, and Metatron is the high priest, um, and he's the only being both angel and human. And Metatron is God's ultimate emissary, and he is chiefly concerned with humanity and its connection to divine force. And he sends energy down to Sandalphon. And it would seem that there's indications that he, um, Halloran could, could, could be in this mythology, Sandalphon. Sandalphon, S-A-N-D-A-L-P-H-O-N. Um, and he sends his energy down to Sandalphon at Malkuf, which is the 10th Sephirot and which is the kingdom, which is the, which is the material world. And at the, that's at the bottom of the, the tree of life. And um, Sandalphon um, is reincarnated. He, is, he, he, was, he was Elijah uh, in the Bible, and he was reincarnated and he was made an angel and he was made into Sandalphon. And he was the ancient old enemy of Baal, as it happens. Um, and he teaches, he helps establish a secure link between heaven and earth. So, and he was, a, he, um, he was the prophet Elijah. Um, and so the shining, it helps to, he, he helps people to talk to God, to help people help themselves. So, and others. So he's teaching Danny about the shining as Sandal thought it would seem. <laughs> it's quite amazing. So anyway, so that's where we get up to. Um, that's where we get up to with the with the with part um, two, part five of this. And then um, I would think it take two other parts to. That's the chalice, yeah. And that's the yeah the Holy Grail. It's to do with the the the, the chevaliers of the Sang Sangrier as well, um, which is the the blood of the chalice, which is the, is the Gnostic Gospels, the Cathars, and all of it. So anyway. Uh, so that's part five. But I, I, as I say, I think it's going to take part six and part seven to actually complete it because there's so much to it. Um, right. Am I done now? Or is, it, is it nearly? Should be 15 minutes, I think.